Hello, and thank you for joining us today in our studies of Mark. Today we're in Mark chapter 5, and in this particular account, we have three different instances of Jesus' healing. And as we talked about in our last video, as we looked at these things and read through chapter 5, you have three very different individuals being healed in three very different ways of three very different types of problems. And yet you have the full spectrum being illustrated of what Jesus could do and how Jesus had the ability and, and the power to influence people's lives. As we look at some of the lessons from chapter 5, I, I'm not necessarily going to rehash all of the events because the events in and of themselves are pretty straightforward. I want us to look at some of the details, and I want us to look at some specific things that transpired in the course of this chapter that I think are enlightening and a bit beneficial for us to delve into a little bit deeper. So let's look at a couple of things. I want us to start in verse 18, because you have this whole situation that occurs with Jesus healing this this individual who has an un, who has a legion of unclean spirits, he sends the the demons into the swine. The swine go into the sea, and then Jesus is well, I won't say politely, but he's asked to leave uh, the entire region. And so, but in verse eighteen, something interesting happens. You have the man who Jesus healed, as far as that goes, who wants to uh, go with Jesus. That it says in verse 18 that when Jesus got into the boat, the one who was demon-possessed begged him that he might be able to go with him. And Jesus tells him no. Now, the reason is a bit on the important side, but it's not a matter that Jesus doesn't want him to follow him or that Jesus doesn't want to be seen with him or that he's done his good deed and now he wants nothing else to do with the man. But rather, it's stated in verse 19, Jesus says, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. He sends him home to tell others about what has transpired. Well, come to find out in verse 20, home is the region of Decapolis, which is the general area in which he is now, which he has been asked to leave. And so when Jesus tells this man to go home and to spread the word of what has happened and what has been done, in essence what he's doing is he is utilizing this man to proclaim the message he is not at this point going to be allowed to proclaim because he has been asked to leave. This follower of Jesus is not going to follow Jesus in getting on the boat. But he is going to go everywhere proclaiming what Jesus did for him and telling people about all that transpired and the people of Decapolis are going to be amazed because of it. While Jesus is not going to be able to stay, he is going to have someone in the region who is going to be able to tell people about who he is and what he is able to do. And so here you have an instance of a follower who does not follow. Not from the standpoint of not being one who believes in Jesus or not being one who is willing to follow Jesus, but rather that the Lord had a different choice that he needed him to make. And that is to stay home and to tell others what it was that had been done. It goes back to the idea that there are many different ways that people serve. And there are many different ways that people are able to utilize their abilities for the furtherance of the service of Christ. And not everybody has the same task. And not everybody has the same abilities. This man had the ability to do something that Jesus and the other disciples that are with him could not do because he lived in the area and he was from the area. And therefore, he could stay and tell about it. 
when Jesus and the disciples were not going to be allowed to. The second thing I want us to notice comes from the healing of the woman with the uh, flow of blood. And she's had this problem for 12 years. But I want you to notice her mentality as she comes to Jesus in verse 26 and 27. It is stated concerning her that she has spent all that she had and was no better. She has spent all of the money that she had. She has tried everything. She has tried every physician. She has gone everywhere that she can go and tried everything that she can do. And over the course of 12 years, nothing has helped. And so when she hears about Jesus, she believes because of the things that she has heard, that he might be the only one who is able to help her. And her mentality is, if only I can touch his clothes, verse 28, I shall be made well. This is a woman who has nothing else to lose. This is a woman who has tried everything else in life, and everything else has failed to be able to remedy her problem. And now is the time when she has the opportunity to reach out to the one who is doing everything that nobody else can do. And she believes. And she believes enough, not just in him, but in the ability that he holds to say that she doesn't even have to meet him, she doesn't even have to talk to him. If she can just touch the hem of his garment, that will be enough. And she does, and immediately she is healed. You know, for a lot of people, it's not until they have reached the end of their rope with things in this world. They have tried everything that there is to try. They've listened to everybody that there is to listen to. They have gotten all of the things that this world has to offer and found them empty that they finally stop and look and realize that there's one thing that they have been ignoring that could have been the answer all along. This woman had nothing else to lose but everything to gain. And many times in our world today, the ones who are willing to stop and listen and be obedient to Christ and to do what God has said are not the ones who have everything. They're the ones who have nothing else to lose. But it is at that point that they realize how much there is to gain in being the servant of Christ. But then a final point to be made comes from the raising of the ruler of the synagogue, Jairus' daughter, when Jesus comes to the house in verse 39, he goes to those who are there and he says to them who are weeping and they're crying and they're, they're completely overwhelmed with grief. He says, why do you make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And, and we sit there and think, wait a second, she was dead. So is he lying to them? Is, is he trying to console them by means of telling them something that's not true? Or, or so just simply trying to make them think that, that this child hasn't died when she has? The interesting thing is in the terminology. The word for sleeping here means to sleep, but it also carries with it the sleep of death to be raised again. And that's one of the uses of this particular term. It's not a permanency, but rather they will that individual or that thing will come back again. The other word, the, the idea of being dead here, is the idea of dead or decayed or destroyed. Never to come back again. The interesting thing with Jesus' statement is it doesn't seem to indicate that he's saying that she's not dead 
or that she hasn't actually died. But rather, it is a sentiment of the fact that she is not dead, never to be recovered, or never to be brought back. In other words, it is not hopeless. She is not gone forever. Now, he is going to be ridiculed in verse number 40 for this. And, you know, there are many of those among the Jews in this particular day that, that don't believe that there is life after death, that don't believe that there is a resurrection. They were of the faction of the Sadducees in that particular day and time. And so it very well may be the case that these are individuals that do not believe in life after death, that death is the end of everything. But Jesus is going to show that that's just simply not true. And he is going to go in and he is going to raise this 12-year-old girl from the place where she was laying, and she will live again. There is life after death because there is an eternal soul. These are some of the things that I found in Mark chapter 5. I hope they're things that are beneficial to you. I hope they're things that are helpful to you. But there's a lot here in this chapter and I hope you take the time to examine it more deeply. Next time we'll come back and we'll begin looking at Mark chapter 6. And I hope that you'll join us then. But until then, have a great day.